Welcome to today's lightning webinar titled, Can I Prevent Cervical Cancer? My name is Amber Ruffin and I'm the Cancer Equity Manager here at the American Indian Cancer Foundation. Before we begin, I have a few things to review with you. Today's webinar is in recognition of Cervical Cancer Awareness Month and it will be about 15 minutes long and is intended to provide a brief overview about preventing cervical cancer. If you have any questions, you can send an email to the health at AICAF.org and we will send a follow-up email answering your questions to the best of our ability. I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Dr. Amanda Briegel. Dr. Briegel is from the Oneida and Stockbridge Muncie tribes, and she works as a gynecologic oncologist at the Oregon Health and Science University. Dr. Briegel specializes in the diagnosis and treatment of gynecologic cancers. She enjoys developing relationships with her patients and their families throughout the course of their cancer treatment and has a research interest in cancer prevention and improving access to treatment in the American Indian and Alaska Native population. In her spare time, Dr. Briegel also enjoys hiking, camping, reading, and traditional Native American beadwork. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Briegel, and feel free to start when you are ready. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us. We're here to talk about, uh, can we prevent cervical cancer? How can you prevent yourself from ever becoming my future patient? Um, first, cervical cancer in Native women. Native women have about one and a half times the incidence of cervical cancer compared to white women. Further, Native women are diagnosed at later stages of disease than white women, which likely contributes to the two times mortality rate that we see from cervical cancer than the general population. So what prevention tools do we have? There are two major things in our toolbox. First is HPV vaccination. And ideally, this is primary prevention. So you have the vaccine prior to um, exposure to the HPV virus. Additionally, there is the pap smear, which many of us are familiar with. And that's a form of secondary prevention. With secondary prevention, we ideally detect pre-invasive disease, so dysplasia or pre-cancer, um, detection of early stage cancer, so if a cancer is there, it's early and very curable, and for some women who are at younger ages, providing fertility sparing cancer surgery uh, so that we can treat the cancer as well as um, ensure that they have future fertility if they so desire. A few words about human papillomavirus. There are over 100 different types of HPV that exist. There's anywhere from 14 to 17 different types of HPV that are associated with cervical cancer. And we typically refer to these as the high-risk HPV. Below there are numbers of many of the um, different subtypes. In the United States, about 70% of all new cervical cancer cases are due to HPV subtypes 16 and 18. There are risk factors that exist for acquiring and then not clearing the HPV virus. So first of all, risk factors for HPV. I think about this in two different ways. One, things that increase our exposure or potential acquisition of HPV, and the other is decreased clearance. So our bodies are equipped to deal with many different illnesses, and HPV is just another virus that your immune system tries to clear. There are things that decrease the ability for us to clear it. In terms of exposure, things that increase your risk of being exposed to HPV our early age of sexual debut or first sexual contact, the number of lifetime sexual partners. So as we have more partners in our lives, the risk of exposure goes up. And also co-infection with other sexually transmitted infections such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and herpes. Things that lead to decreased clearance are in two major categories. One, immunosuppression. There are different medical conditions that lead your immune system to be less powerful at combating the virus than others. There is also smoking. Um, smoking is a very, very critical cofactor or major player in preventing us from clearing that virus. When we're thinking about immunosuppression, the main types of patients that I think of are those who have the HIV virus, people with an, a history of a transplant, so a kidney or bone marrow transplant. There are medications that really prevent their immune system from fully responding and then certain immune disorders. So things like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, where you're chronically on steroids that may inhibit your immune system's ability to conquer the virus. 
There is very, very little information published on what are the subtypes that affect Native American women. There was one study that was done in the Southwest where they looked at the different types of HPV associated with CIN2, and that's moderate precancer of the cervix um, in the United States and Southwest Native populations. In this table, you can see there's the HPV subtypes, so 16, 18, and then the combination or any other high-risk HPV. And you, can, you see that it's compared to the US population versus the Native population. HPV-16 is well known to be a very common contributor to cervical precancer and cancer in the US, about 42% in this study. If you look at the Native study in the Southwest population, only about 17% of the Native women had HPV-16. Further, if you look at HPV-18, the second most common type in the United States, there is still a difference, but not quite so significant between the two populations. If we look at the combination of the two most common types in the United States, 16 and 18 together, you have about 48% of the US population, but about 20% of the native population. Our rates of high-risk HPV are not lower than the general US population. This means that there are potentially other types of high-risk HPV that are impacting the native community that don't seem to be as prevalent in the general US population. So how do we prevent getting HPV in the first place? Here's a, a kind of a bulky table that has the different, three different types of commercially available HPV vaccinations. Um, the one on the far left is less commonly used. Um, it can, it um, vaccinates against HPV subtype 16 and 18 only. Um, for patients who are allergic to latex, um, they cannot receive this vaccine. Um, and it, it provides coverage against 16 and 18, and it's been shown to be very effective. The most common one that's being used these days is Gardasil 9, the one on the, the far right. This offers protection against HPV subtypes 16 and 18, just like the others. However, it provides protection against five additional high-risk types and two low-risk types. This is what's used almost universally now in the United States. The only patients who should not receive this are people who have an allergic reaction to yeast. And this vaccine is thought to prevent about um, 85 to 90% of the um, HPV-related cancers in the United States. In terms of who should get it and when, there's the, Amer uh, sorry, the American Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. It's a national organization that makes guidelines for all sorts of vaccines. Depending on your age, you may be um, required to have either two or three vaccine doses. So for the younger age group, ages 9 to 14, um, you only need two vaccine doses to get maximal effectiveness. So you would come in and get your HPV vaccine on that first day, and then 6 to 12 months later, you would get the second vaccine, and you would be considered complete. For young kids who are immune compromised, so for example, if they've had a bone marrow transplant <clears throat> or... Um, uh, juvenile arthritis where they need to be on immunosuppression, they would not be included in the two vaccine only category. But for most healthy youth, two vaccines is all that's needed for maximal protection. For the rest of us, um, so the immune compromised youth as well as individuals between 15 and 26, three vaccines are needed to get maximal protection from that. And so this is um, three vaccines essentially over the course of a year. So at time zero, one month later, and six months later. There's been a recent FDA approval to the extend the eligibility to receive this vaccine to age 45. Um, the vaccine recommendations nationally haven't been updated to reflect this yet, but um, in the age groups 15 to 45, you would need the three vaccine series. I think it's great that this has been expanded to provide protection to more individuals in the United States. However, I do want to emphasize that the best, the best ages and the best time is really in the young age group between 9 and 12. The immune system is incredibly well um, poised to receive this vaccine and respond appropriately. And for most, most youth, they have not been exposed to the virus through sexual activity quite yet. And so the best protection is still at the younger age of the approved age groups. So a little bit about pap smear screening. Um, for, for most women, we have not gotten to our ages without having had one of these before. Um, but what happens is you come to the office and you see your provider. Um, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner, you see a woman's legs up in, in the stirrups, and that's to gently cradle your legs so that we can do an exam. Um, a speculum 
is introduced into the vagina, and what we do is visualize your cervix. As you can see on the right, there is a picture of a uh, cervix that's normal in appearance right there. I say it looks like a pink bagel. So it's a nice circular uniform structure. And what your provider does at the time of a pap smear is they place a brush um, along the surface of the cervix, and it goes just inside the opening a tiny bit. This causes an exfoliation of the cells that are naturally on the surface, uh, surface of the cervix, um, and then this sample is sent to your pathologist to review. So this is an example of what does the pathologist or the cytologist see? So once the sample is put in the liquid, it's sent off to the lab, and the, there's a special preparation that they do. The um, pictures on the top represent the cervical cells on the pap smear. Moving from left to right, we have normal cells to very abnormal. Now, I don't expect you to become pathologists just with this uh, talk, but what your pathologist is looking for is essentially how much do we see of that dark middle center. I think they look like fried eggs, okay? And as the yolk of the egg, um, as the um, proportion of yolk increases to the white of the egg, that's more concerning for changes within the cervix. So on the far left, you have a lot of white and a little bit of yolk, and as you move to the right, it becomes mostly yolk and a lot of, um, and quite a bit less white. So how often do you need this pap smear anyway? This is incredibly frustrating for providers and I think patients because the national recommendations for guidelines have changed quite a bit over the past 10 years. This is just a review of the current guidelines um, in the United States. So if a woman is less than 21 years of age, there is no cervical cancer screening that needs to be done. It used to be that for young women to have their birth control access, that they would need to have a pelvic exam, and that is no longer the standard of care, and you can comfortably receive birth control without having the pelvic exam. Once a woman reaches the age of 21 through the ages of 29, we do um, cytology only. So that's where we take the brushing of the cells and we look at the, the slide to see if they're normal abnormal. At the age of 30, we start to add HPV testing to our algorithm. So the, my ideal recommendation is for having HPV and the pap smear every five years, but also there are some acceptable alternatives. So you can do a pap smear only without the HPV testing every three years, or in some areas, they're moving in entirely to HPV testing, and that's every three years. At the age of 65, you can stop screening unless you've had a history of moderate or severe precancer, um, and then you need to continue. So if you've had a procedure on your cervix at the age of 55 because of an abnormal pap smear, you need to continue with pap smears for 20 years after that diagnosis of the moderate or severe precancer. So in women with HIV, um, there are some different recommended guidelines for screening. So we said that women less than 21 do not need to have um, cervical pap smear screening. However, the risk with HIV for developing cervical cancer is higher, and so we recommend heightened um, screening processes for them. So cervical cancer screening in women with HIV should begin within one year of the diagnosis. So if someone is diagnosed with HIV at the age of 16, they should be having their first pap smear by the age of 17, or within one year after the initiation of sexual, sexual activity. So if a child is born and has the HIV virus, you would follow them with routine care as a provider um, until they have their sexual coming of age. So let's say that's age 14. Um, one year, so between 14 and 15, you would start pap smear screening um, because they've had the onset of sexual activity. And another thing that's different than the general guidelines is that cervical cancer screening should continue for the entire duration of a woman's lifetime. So in a woman with HIV, you should not stop at the age of 65. A lot of information in a short amount of time. In case you are feeling overwhelmed, here are the take home points of today's talk. First, cervical cancer is preventable. HPV vaccination is the most powerful tool we have. It is approved for ages nine to 45 now. Um, as the, the guidelines just changed for the FDA approval up to age 45, insurance companies may not be up to speed with this yet, so check with your provider if you're between the ages of 26 and 45 in this new age group. I want to emphasize that the target ages for the, the vaccine is 11 to 12. I think it's, this is the best time in someone's life to get the vaccine, um, but certainly understand that um, not all of us can be perfect and right on target. 
And last, pap smears can detect precancer and early stage cancer. Thank you, Dr. Regal, for sharing this valuable information. I would also like to thank everyone who's watching this webinar in partnership with the American Indian Cancer Foundation and Dr. Amanda Briegel. Please contact us at the American Indian Cancer Foundation by emailing health at AICAF.org if you have any further questions. Also, please join us on Tuesday, January 15th at 12 p.m. Central Time to learn about what abnormal PAP results mean. Thank you.